Welcome everybody to episode six of the Trip Sing podcast. I gotta say, this was probably one of my favorite episodes to record so far, uh, just because it was a little less question and answer and more of just two people just kind of getting to know each other. And I felt like we got pretty deep and um, we learned a lot and, and I had a really, really good time talking with, uh, with Jack. Um, some of the things we talk about is he actually grows mushrooms. He microdoses himself. He's had other journeys, uh, taking macro doses of mushrooms as well. Um, and we just talk about his life. He's from South Africa and he just has a lot of really cool perspectives, really interesting things to share. And we had a really great conversation because of that. So I hope you guys enjoy as well. And without further ado, here is Jack. One thing I want to start with, and this is this is just an idea that I had this last week. I'm curious, have you ever done? Do you do you do meditation at all? I don't. I mean, I've been on a couple of retreats, and um, you know, I've okay. done it when in ceremony and stuff. And I don't, I don't battle with it. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people really battle. I find it really easy, but I don't. Yeah. I don't practice meditation myself. No. Okay, so I want to start out by doing just a quick exercise to get us basically like here and present and okay. open. And basically, it's just two minutes of box breathing. Have you ever done box breathing mm, before? I've done other breathing exercises, but, you know, have been high. So I don't really okay. <laughs> don't recall. Okay. So box box breathing is not is not meant to get you high. It's basically just like you breathe in for four seconds, you hold for four seconds, you breathe out for four seconds, you hold for four seconds. And we're just going to do that for okay. two minutes. So. Basically, it's just a way to like ground you and like center yourself um, and just kind of just get like a little bit of presence. And then also the fact that we're doing it while we're being recorded, you're going to look a little silly. And that's the whole point. All right. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I'm going to start the timer and then we're going to breathe in. Are you going to guide it? I'll let you know. We're uh... just doing this in our own time. Okay. And that is that. I actually feel a lot better for that. So (laughs) thanks. Awesome. Yeah, no, that was, uh, that was something that, uh, something that I thought about this week after like that, that whole kind of discussion I had with myself last week about like, okay, how do I make this more awkward? Because like, (laughs) I'm also not used to being recorded and people seeing this and like, this is all still like so new for me too. Um, it's not, it's not natural and I don't think it's really natural for anybody Yeah, (laughs) unless you've done it. I think you have to be trained for it. Yeah. But you seem to be doing well, Cam. I've watched a couple of your previous podcasts. I think (laughs) you're doing really well. Good for you. I appreciate it, man. I really do. I, I, I appreciate having people that are interested and and engaged and also people that like I can learn from as well. Um, which is kind of one of the reasons why I reached out to you originally, um, was just to be like, I, I want to know, I want to know who the fuck's following. <laughs> also, really, like... <laughs> I, actually really interesting. That's why I started following you because I, like I said to you in a previous message, I was learning, wanting to learn more about trip sitting and that is your blog's name. So I was mm-hmm. hoping to learn from you. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of a win-win for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for sure. Yes. I mean, I mean, really kind of just what, what I want the format of this to be is like, I think some of my previous ones have been a little bit more question and answer. Um, and while I kind of like that, again, I think that kind of gets into the, like the mindset of, of being like, Oh, we have to keep talking and all that. And like, it, it, it kind of puts some, put some guardrails up for like how people want to answer things. And so I want to make this more of just basically like two people who have never met each other, which is very true in this moment right now. Um, All we've done is just chat through Instagram message is literally just like getting to know each other and like understanding. I mean, basically just like each other's lives and stuff. So like any questions that you ever have for me, ask away. And then I kind of want to do the same and to get started with that. um, One of the things that you talked about that I definitely want to dive in is one, you grow mushrooms. Yeah, I do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so how did you get started with doing that? Uh, well, it, th- there is a long and intricate story. So it actually started out, my husband is an engineer. He's a really smart guy. Mm-hmm. And he goes through yeah. phases of like hobbies where nothing really sticks for long. You know, he built this incredible greenhouse and filled it with expensive orchids, which have all subsequently died. 
Um, but you know, I, I like after a couple of months when he had lost interest, I quickly got in and tried to revive and take control and that sort of thing. And I don't know, you can see his desk behind me. So there's like a 3D printer that's gathering mm -hmm. dust now. And I don't know. So he wanted to, to grow magic mushrooms um, just to see if he could. And um, obviously I had always been very interested in plant medicines. So he did. He, he grew a batch or two, maybe three. I don't know. I think it was like two and um, grew tired of it. Um, so, yeah, is what really kept the, I mean, the mushroom growing going was that um, I was wanting to come off a lot of my SSRI um, medications and anxiety medications and things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't battle with anything huge. I don't feel it's huge for me. I think that my issues are like environmental and circumstantial. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to come off the medications. And so we decided to, to make microdoses for myself. Um, so we did. Yeah. We bought this little capsule machine and, you know, we went through the process of learning how to dry these mushrooms properly and then grind them up into a fine enough powder and how to pack them and get the weights correct. And that was a trial and error. I mean, I, mean, I remember driving, <laughs> driving to work one morning and it just rained and I was like, driving like this everything was sparkling <laughs> it was so shiny and i was like oh it's a bit heavy this morning <laughs> uh do not recommend anybody um you know has a recreational mushrooms and then drives don't do that um so yeah i went through this like process of learning how to get get the dosages right um just for myself and then i mean personally i started taking them whilst i was still on um, my prescribed medications. Again, please don't, whoever listens to this, don't, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> don't do the things I do. Yeah. I give, I give, I have to give that same disclaimer just about yeah, every single yeah, episode. Cause I'll, I'll, I'll eventually please, get into nobody it. Nobody must do the things um, I do just and don't do the things I say either. <laughs> yeah. Um, mushrooms. I also too, mushrooms are still, are still illegal yeah. in South, yeah. like completely illegal. Much, like yeah. what's, I mean, have you seen the stigma changing at all in South Africa where mm -hmm. you're at? Because I think in the U.S. it's definitely changing a bit. But like, I mean, there's certain areas where I mean, if I'm if I go to the fucking south, people are still probably going to be like, oh, this, you know, the, the, they they still fucking hate weed. <laughs> um, so so it's different. But yeah, I mean, I I, I know actually almost nothing about South yeah, Africa. Well, um, it, it is illegal. Um, you know, so my my growing is obviously extremely small scale. Um, I think that um, yeah. our police force is definitely occupied with, you know, much bigger fish. Um, although yeah. having said that, touch wood, I don't want like trouble or anything. So um, it's illegal. Um, you know, you, it's illegal to possess the fruiting bodies and um, to produce them, um, to have them dried or encapsulated or in any other form. However, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, um, the spores and the mycelium itself are not illegal from my from my. I research. think that's the yeah. same. I, I believe, and I'm not 100% sure that it's kind of the same rule here in the u.s too regardless of where you are that the spores yeah. you can have in the mycelium but you can't have any fruit definitely uh, i mean it's so interesting you can legally trade in the spores but not in in the fruit um just also <laughs> like i mean i know i know it's illegal but like it blows my mind i mean it's a plant how are you outlawing something that occurs naturally and i mean we have naturally occurring species in south africa um <clears throat> you know wavy tops liberty caps um natal super strength there are a number of different strains of the psilocybe um cubensis that occur naturally here and somehow they're illegal i don't know i can't get my head around that <laughs> Do you know anything, I guess, about the history of it in South Africa? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I know here in the U.S., it wasn't actually outlawed until the late yeah. 60s. Before then, it was completely illegal to have and possess. And Yeah. Um, I don't know about selling, but... So, yeah. I, I don't know much, actually. It's probably something I okay. should look up. But funnily enough, when you do look up the history of, of psilocybin mushrooms, it's predominantly in the U.S., like you say, outlawed in the... 60s that's because it were they were only rediscovered in the 50s in in mexico yeah um you know maria sabina and her whole story um yeah so i, I don't know much about it here but it is still illegal um 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So b- back to this, where I was um, driving to work, you know, look at all these diamonds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Rain looks pretty cool beautiful. today. <laughs> anyway. Um, so realized it was a bit heavy. Um, so went through this whole trial and error and eventually got the dosages right. And then, you know, started like coming out with it, I guess, to, to friends and, and family. And, you know, everyone was super exec- accepting of it because I think that the global trend is to move back towards natural solutions. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was getting such positive reviews from, from friends and family and then they wanted some. So, you know, give them some and, you know no charge or anything just you know sharing and um yeah it's it's sort of it sort of grew from there um and now it's becoming like a huge demand but it's it's very difficult to keep up supply um especially when you're dealing in something illegal yeah how i guess how much do you try to like do you now have i guess enough of a sort of demand from whatever base that you've kind of built up around you that like you need to keep kind of a certain supply or like do you do you, do you try to um i try to it's not successful because <laughs> someone will come <laughs> and like place a huge order and then you know I'll, I'll supply as best i can and then i'll be out for a couple of weeks because yeah. um you know i produce such small quantities um so i mean i do my best but what is a small quantity <laughs> to you <laughs> well dry weight maybe <sighs> maybe 800 grams every two months or so 800 grams every two months it goes a lot further yeah, i can see how that could be considered <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i could see how that could be considered small but i, mean, <laughs> I guess that's um, when you've got i guess i mean could would you be able to estimate i guess how many people probably consistently want something honestly, from you maybe 10 um okay yeah got it. it's it's small um but then my, my entire like client base are generally people I know um, actually like yeah. people that I interact with often or their friends. So um, it, it's really nice because at least I feel safe and it's like an intimate sort of circle of supply. Mm, yeah. Very helpful. So easy to, easy to contain. Yeah, definitely. How, how long, I guess, were you on SSRIs before you started microdosing? Honestly, Cam, it's, uh, it's probably been on and off for about 20 odd years. Yeah. I was, yeah, Holy I was shit. very young. I was, I think I was 12 when I was first prescribed something, something quite hardcore. It was actually Prozac. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wild. Yeah. I've never, I've, I've luckily never never had to take any to any 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 ssris or, or kind of had that i mean like do you remember do you remember being 12 or at least like being young and like did you understand why you were taking that or like was it just kind of doctors just like telling you that you needed to look so i'm, I'm from zimbabwe initially like i was born okay. and raised there so when i was about 12 i mean if you go and research about 20 years ago what happened in zimbabwe there were huge economic and political issues. So there were like land seizures and like murders and just hectic, horrible, horrible goings on. Um, So again, like I said, initially, it was all very circumstantial for me and very environmental. So it was what was happening around me immediately. You know, my friends and families were losing farms and and property and, um, you know, emigrating, leaving the country. And, you know, you go through this huge abandonment issue and I mean, just to branch off from there quickly, if you look at it, like, I'm sure you still have friends from junior school and high school that you're in touch with today. Mm-hmm. All of mine have emigrated. So I'm probably in touch with maybe two or three of them. And the rest of them, I, I mean, okay. my long, long-term long friendships like that haven't really carried through. Anyway, so, yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, and there was also the situation of, you know, being gay and coming out with that and you know when i was about 12 i started realizing oh you know something's very pink (laughs) so (laughs) so, yeah so i had i had like these issues and i I mean like i said circumstantial and environmental for me and so yeah when i went through a hard patch and uh, you know things became hard i would uh, i used the medications as a as a crutch and you know they worked at the time um 
And yeah. as you get older, you know, you start getting terrible side effects from them. You know, um, not all of mm-hmm. them are weight neutral. They affect your libido. They affect a, a whole range of other things, blood pressure. So, you know, I just personally was looking for something more natural. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, having had micro, macro dose experiences, at least, um, seeing the benefit that you gain from those, um, just incredible. And I knew that that was the right the right road for me to follow. Yeah. yeah. When was your first macrodose experience? When? Um, yeah. Yeah, it was probably 2015. So it was surprisingly recent. Um, okay. Yeah. Was that, so that's that's not super no, far away. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. Um, yeah, I, I was I was living alone at the time and in in this little apartment, which. Um, yeah, and I had these mushrooms, and it was amazing. And I was like, "Wow, this is incredible! This is this is medicine, you know, medicine for your soul." How did you, how did you get those mushrooms to be like? Did, was was it always something you're like, "I want to do this," and you finally just did it, yeah. or like, did it kind of just come together and happen? And you're like, "Oh, what the fuck?" So, uh, to be honest, I don't remember where I got those initial mushrooms from. Um, okay. I th- I think a friend gave them to me. Yeah, I think I think it was a friend, but. I just remember always wanting to to try them. I, I'm more inclined to try something recreational like that if I know it's natural, like THC yeah. or um, psilocybin mushrooms or ayahuasca. You know, something I know is is a natural plant. Essentially, is that's yeah. better for me. I'm not so heavy into chemicals. Mm. Mm-hmm. Have you done ayahuasca? I before? have. I've done it a handful of times. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I know that's you have too, Cam. Where? Yeah, where did where did you uh, where did you do yeah, that? Yeah, well, I did not schlep to the jungle like you did. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually made mention of the power of psilocybin mushrooms at work um, in an architectural practice, and um, one of my colleagues um, was obviously paying attention and listening to me, and he approached me later and it's like, "Hey," mm-hmm. <laughs> and turns out that he is like a 70 year old ayahuasca shaman and he's like hey let's go up this hill and drink ayahuasca and i was like Fuck yeah <laughs> that's yeah, sir that's awesome what do you what do you do for i guess what is your what is your day job i am an interior designer um do okay. not love that but <laughs> here we are <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna i was gonna ask how what was the have, have you always been an interior designer have, or have yeah. you have you bounced no, around I, I studied i studied design so it's something, okay. yeah, that's the only thing I really know how to do besides the mushrooms. Actually, I mean, I say I hate it. I, I actually don't. It it pays it pays well. And the company where I work now, uh, look after me. It's great, actually. Yeah. So, you, I mean, as far as the job itself, though, so take away, take away the pay, take away the people that you're with, just doing your work. Do you love that? Uh, Cam, you don't always get to do, like, beautiful jobs no. like some of it is God, dog no. work <laughs> but you know when you yeah. get those beautiful jobs yeah it's it's rewarding um yeah okay. i mean if i if i could get the, the mushrooms to pay me enough to to quit i would definitely <laughs> rather go around drinking coffee with my my new friends and <laughs> sharing medicine but i don't know if it's realistic for me at the moment yeah no i i i asked that so i actually um i've I've only been in the workforce now for fuck three years, something yeah. like that. So not, not, not very long. I, I graduated college in 2019. Um, and then I went into software sales, okay. um, just cause I've always, I've always worked for startups, been interested in just startups and like specifically like tech startups. Like, you know, that's, that's, that's all the rage. It's trendy. Yeah. It's fun. Um, so I did that and recently have been noticing that I, don't love software sales. Like there's nothing about selling software that like is inherently rewarding. And so like, I've been doing a lot of thinking like, fuck, if I, if I could not do this, what would I do? And I don't have an answer to that question. It'll come. But I think, I think it'll come. But, uh, uh, last, last Tuesday, I I actually just got laid off. Oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) And so, (laughs) no, it's, 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 it's really, it's funny. Like, I mean, that's, I mean, parts of it are funny. Parts of it are like, oh, fuck. I feel like the universe <laughs> but is like, pushing you out the nest here, Cam. That's, that's like exactly what I felt like. Like it was almost no time at all 
when that happened to me being like, holy shit, what a cool opportunity for me to, to me to be forced now to figure out, okay, like if I wanted to get another job in software sales, I could probably do so. No problem. I don't think I would have any, any issues doing that, but I'm like, okay, well, if I wasn't fucking liking this before now, I actually like have a chance very rarely in life. Yeah. Very rarely in life. I think do people ever get the chance to once, once you're an adult, if, if I said, if you could wake up tomorrow and do anything you want to do, what would you I'd do? I'd be a house husband. And now <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, that sounds awesome. Unfortunately, I don't have anyone to support, but myself, <laughs> which doesn't, doesn't make it easy. How long have a, uh, uh, how long have you and your husband been together? We've been together for six years this month, actually. Um, married for three okay. and a half. Yeah. Okay. Married for three and a half. Do you guys have, have any kids? Definitely not. I mean, the biology just doesn't work. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. Well, you can, no, you I'm, can, you can I'm adopt. Yeah. No, no. We have five dogs <laughs> and a cat. I think we're good for now. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> five dogs. Um, How the fuck did that well, happen? <laughs> uh, we, uh, we're very lucky. We have a really big yard for them. So that's good. I mean, two okay. of them are pretty small dogs. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, five dogs and a cat. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that sounds like a full time. Do you, do both of you work in an office? Does one of you get to work from home? Yeah, well, like how, how do you take care of the, like, how does this logistically well, work? Well, you know, so South Africa <laughs> is very economically different to the States. So we're very lucky mm -hmm. here in that labor is super affordable. So we have a lot of help. We have, um, okay. a, a, a lady who comes in to clean for us twice a week. Um, we have okay. a garden service as well as a casual gardener. So um, yeah. they're in like two days a week. And um, then my husband gets to work home from like Tuesday to at home from Tuesday to Tuesday and Wednesday, I think. Yeah. And then okay. my, my company is really cool in that they don't demand we go into the office. So like last week, I didn't go in at all. Uh, but also I did have swine flu. Can you believe Um you had swine flu. I got swine flu when when it first came out. When it first yeah, dropped, yeah, you you did it well. Um, it was trendy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I did. I did it when it was cool. I've also now had. I've I've now had COVID three times. Wow. You know, I haven't um, had it once. And I've been and I'm and I'm f I'm fully vaccinated with a booster and everything. Yeah. And I I've had it three times. I find this amazing. You know, <laughs> I didn't know I had swine flu. I was just feeling really shitty for like two and a half weeks. Um. Anyway, I saw the doctor. <laughs> Two and a half weeks. <laughs> I saw the doctor because I was due for Botox. Anyway, um, he's like, no, you have a fever and check me out. He's like, mm, swine flu. I, was like, I didn't even know that was still a thing. Um, Who the fuck still gets that? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and then like COVID, I haven't had even once. So I don't know what's up with that. I'm also like fully vaccinated, got a booster, you know, doing my thing. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah feel like I've missed out. Have, is, 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 is COVID still, I guess, like a thing that people are worried about in South Africa at all? Or is it like, did just, is everybody able to just go about I their lives like and not wear masks? As the and just... Russian Ukraine war started, everyone was like, ah, we're done with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, we were pretty, I mean, we were, we were probably done with it before that, <laughs> not done with it, but just, it just, it just kind of became a normal thing that you can get again. I, I mean, I never, I never got terribly sick or anything. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I know people that did. So it's, it's different for everybody. I did lose my taste and smell though for wow. like a year. Yeah. Like a, it, it was terrible. That was, that was on like the most depressed I think wow. I've ever been. How did you eat? In, in my entire life. Shame. Dude, I, I lost, I lost like 10 pounds in like the first like month or two months just from, cause like I just wasn't hungry. I mean, that's at least there's um, an upside. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's if you, that's if you want to lose weight, I'm not somebody who, who needed to lose any weight. I'm already like, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm like pretty, 5'11 pretty and like 160 yeah. pounds. Is it? Yeah, exactly. You can, you can, you can tell I need to, I need to bulk up a little bit. Sorry um, about that. So yeah, that was, that was, yeah, I mean, so it, it was tough. And what was interesting is I was like, I was lost. I was, I was depressed. Shame. I like, you know, it's, you know, it's the middle of COVID. We're still still not really going out and everything. And so what I did 
my idea was like, how do I get over this was to take five grams of mushrooms <laughs> and, <laughs> and see, see how I could see how my mind could basically like get through this. Um, and I remember that experience actually helping so yeah. much with the depression, well. like so much. It was <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, it, one, it just, it just kind of connected me to myself again, which I, I had felt very just disconnected for myself. Cause I love food, man. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely like a foodie. I love eating. I love cooking. I love going out. Nice. Like that's how, like I make myself happy okay. and losing the way to make yourself happy. Oh. Like it's something that, you know, can give you a quick dopamine rush, oh. you know, without having that anymore. It was like, fuck, what do I do? So like, I remember on that, on that experience, it was, I mean, basically just said like, Hey, listen, man, like you, you can still just be ha like being, you know, seeing joy in things like that's a choice. And like, yeah, it, there's, it's, it's not like I couldn't completely smell or taste like anything at all. Like I could taste salt. I could taste sugar. I could do textures. And it was being like, just cause you can't traditionally taste the way that you want to, doesn't mean that you can't still find a way to enjoy food mm. and like it just kind of reframed my thinking around how i enjoy food it's again. so interesting how you use that word reframed because have you read any of michael pollan's books yeah yeah i read i read how to change your minds before the documentary came out yeah. and then i watched it but i haven't read his other because one. So michael pollan definitely my favorite author at the moment and yeah, I was reading him before he came out on Netflix and before he was so cool. <laughs> anyway, um, he... Before he was trendy. Before he was trendy, yeah. Um, so <laughs> in the book, um, if you have the same copy I do, there's that beautiful illustration on the inside of each cover of the actual back and the front of how the placebo medicine and how the psilocybin medicine work. Um, <clears throat> you, uh, you'll be familiar with it. There's like some colors in a circle and then with the... With the um, psilocybin there's like a huge network of colors in that same circle yeah and that's what the psilocybin does to to your brain it's such a beautiful illustration to me it reframes your your perceptions yeah. and yeah i like that yeah that's what's like that's what's so interesting about the medicine when i take it is like it's not it's not changing like what's actually like happening, like on the outside or like, you know, I didn't get my smell and taste back, which I was, I, I had this ridiculous hypothesis. Like maybe I'll just fucking get it back. Like, I don't know. Maybe my brain. You never powerful. know what these things do. Um, yeah, exactly. That didn't happen. But again, it, it, it helps reframe that. And like, that's what any of these, like any, I guess, psychedelic journey that like I've ever taken has done. It's like, it's taking the exact same situation, the way that I think about it. And basically just like, giving me a different way to look at it that makes complete sense like it's not it's not weird it's not like out of out of this world by any concept but like just being able to reframe how you see the exact same situation because like your brain gets caught in these feedback loops and these cycles that like yeah. if you don't have tools to get out of it you're never going to and so it's just a tool to help you basically break that cycle for a little bit, see it in a different way, but then you got to do this integration work afterwards or else <laughs> it's just going to go back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's work. What, uh, yeah. Just um, going back to what you were saying about being stuck in like that psychological rut. Um, <clears throat> that's another just thing about these medicines that are just so powerful is that they are <laughs> habit breaking. They're not habit forming. I mean, you know, after that, that five gram, journey you went on how soon did you go back uh oh i don't know i it was it was a while <laughs> yeah, because you you'd had enough so yeah it's 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 absolutely i had a lot to yeah, work on <laughs> and that's what's so interesting about like old school thinking about it is that you know these are like gateway drugs and the next thing you're gonna you know using something you know, relatively hard, like heroin or something. <clears throat> I know my parents yeah. are like, oh my God, you're going to be living under a bridge in six months. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so, um, <laughs> calm yeah, down. just remain calm. Um, so yeah, these, as you, if you've done a lot of reading about it, you'll see all these clinical trials that are coming out, how, um, you know, psilocybin and things are being used to treat addiction and, um, just sort of break those mental mental habits and those pathways. Uh, I think 
the best um, analogy that I've heard of it was if you imagine a pile of sand, you know, you're on the beach and you build a little pile of sand and you take a drop of water and you drop it over the top and you let that um, droplet run down the side. You take another drop, you drop it, yeah. and there's already a channel there. It's going to go down the same channel, and eventually you'll have a groove, and then eventually you'll have this grand canyon of of mm-hmm. habit. That is what a habit is. And then what the, the psilocybin does is um, creates a number of those pathways and then those little grooves yeah. and then eventually those canyons, and that just helps you break habit. Yeah, I was. I, I think I've I've seen that analogy too with like with like if you're going down like a mountain skiing or something like that, and basically kind of like the psilocybin. It's like not even necessarily that it creates more channels for you to go down. It's more of just it's just going to put fresh sand on top of it. So now you're just starting over Absolutely. fresh. Absolutely. And so now you get to like choose Which, now. Mm-hmm. Okay, rather than going down this one, I can now see all of these different paths that I didn't even see before. And like, you can be more intentional about how you're choosing it. Cause I mean, as we grow up, these grooves, they, I mean, they get shaped for us. We don't actively (laughs) shape them. They get shaped for us by what you were talking about earlier is like your environment. like growing up in Zimbabwe and having a lot of political and economic turmoil. Um, you know, you're not consciously choosing how you're going to react to situations and how you're going to think like you're young, you're still learning the world. And basically you're learning that the world's (laughs) fucked up. Like that's going to create a lot of problems growing up unless you do something to fix it. Definitely. I I agree. Uh, I like that as well, that it's that fresh layer of sand that you can then choose those options. That's also a really good, good analogy. Yeah. So how with 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 your microdosing practice that you do right now, I guess, do you like, are you always doing it? Like, do you are there times where you're like, okay, I need a break now? Like, are you setting intentions? What is the what's what's the what's the what's the logistics behind it? Wow. Uh, I feel like that's there's a lot to answer in that question. Um, <clears throat> Cam, yeah, <laughs> we got time. I, I do it. I do it all the time. Unless like recently when I had to sell absolutely everything because I needed to fill an order. I feel like I'd rather just help <laughs> help others, you know, because I'm such a martyr. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I do it all the time. I am consistent. I do it five out of seven days. So it's very okay. important to break for two days. Um, there, are, there are a number of different methods you can follow. So uh, the one I chose was to break for two days. So I don't microdose on a Saturday and a Sunday, only because those are the easiest days to remember um, and then I microdose first thing in the morning. So like while I'm brushing my teeth, I have a cap mm. and then, um, yeah. Empty, empty stomach. stomach. Yeah. Get it in. Um, <laughs> so I'm finding for me, the intention is, um, I just need to not be so angry on the road. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get bad road uh, rage? Yeah, like a, a, I get, I get frustrated. Um, also like at work, uh, you know, you get frustrated or you get like upset or something. And what I'm finding with the microdose is that it really just helps me like rationalize a situation. So it, yeah. it really just helps me. Yeah. Rationalize emotional situations. It helps me with my creativity, which is obviously hugely important in my line of work. And it helps me, yeah. um, it helps me focus too. So if I really need to, to zone in, I can find a quiet spot. And instead of picking up my phone and being on Instagram and getting absolutely nothing out of that experience, I um, <laughs> can focus on my work and then have a, have a better day and then feel a lot more fulfilled. So <clears throat> for me, it helps with a number of things. Yeah. Do you microdose? Does your, I, so I've, I've, I've tried microdosing. I think I want to try again um, now that I, I was I like after after doing ayahuasca like my just the way that I look at life and see the world and can meditate and um am a lot more comfortable taking a back seat to my emotions and feelings that come up and just like observing them and like understanding them. I think I would get a lot more out of it now than I did before. Um just cuz I understand myself and the world better. Did you get that same 
I guess, kind of experience after you did ayahuasca for the first time? Like, was it was it a super, super life changing thing for you, or was it more of just it was you know it was a different type of modality? My first ayahuasca other than mushrooms, ceremony. yeah. <clears throat> My first yeah. ayahuasca ceremony, Cam. Um, I was so tightly wound that yeah. mid ceremony, I could have stood up and driven home. It it was yeah. unbelievable. I sat there watching all these hippies like throwing up and doing weird stuff <laughs> around me. And I was like, oh, these people are out of control. And this chick is doing this. And what is happening? <laughs> so for me, it was like, this is a bit dumb. And then like, yeah, I had a little bit of, a little bit of like visions, you know, I saw some feathers and there was maybe a snake over there. And then like the only thing <laughs> I really realized was that my mother loves me, but that was it. And it was very mild. Um, yeah. But, you're like, cool, I, I probably could have figured that out myself. Yeah, oh, definitely. <laughs> it's like, this is expensive <laughs> and I, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> so, but I went back and y- yeah, really like my second and third time, those were huge. Um, and I think it, I think I needed the first time, you know, these medicines work differently for everybody and everybody's, yeah, for everyone. And every journey is also just completely individual. So yeah, the second one, I realized that the first one was like to try and like ease me into it. I think the medicine was like, you'll be okay. Um, yeah. And then the second one, wow, she kicked me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was hectic. I was also like throwing up and like doing this. And I was like, oh my God, I'm a hippie now. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did, did, did you always have, I guess, a, a, a negative connotation towards, being i guess like that kind of open hippie attitude like did you did you not want to be considered well, that absolutely i mean i grew up in an extremely conservative country and with an extremely conservative yeah. family and even now i mean south africa is not the most liberal place in the world um so no. i know that <laughs> so um, <laughs> I don't know much, but I know that. So, yeah, I, it, it it was a concern. You know, I, I wasn't sure where I was going and where I really fit in in these circles, if I fit in at all. Um, it, it was it was strange. And then I, I think as soon as yeah. you just – the word is surrender. As soon as you surrender to it. I was just about yeah. to say that. It's surrendering to the experience. I was, I was also – this. I mean, I felt very – tightly wound like i i it's so weird because i thought i was so open to shit and like open to change and stuff and like i was super open to external change i was always easy at you know easy good at doing that and so i thought that that meant that i was good at internally changing as well but (laughs) but no i was so good at changing my external environment that that caused me to believe (laughs) that like I, I could change my external environment, but keep everything inside me the same, which is the opposite of what I need to be doing. It's like, I need to be more open to changing my internal environment and like actually getting to, to, to know and understand myself. But people don't like to change though. It's, it's hard and it's, it's scary. It's against human yeah. nature to want to Absolutely. change. Like we, we, we have our egos, for evolutionary purposes it's it's for survival definitely and we're a lot of us are past the point where we need to worry about food shelter water things like that there are still a lot Mm. of people out there in the world that do have to worry about that and so they're in a different place than us but like for people that don't have to worry about that like now it's all it's it's gone away from physiological factors and now it's all psychological factors um of trying to like maintain control of who we are as a person and like we get so attached to things we get so attached to like parts of our being that we label as good or bad and then we try to keep the ones we think are good and get rid of the ones that we think are bad when it's it's all just there. Like we have to just let it be and let it flow. It's all just a gray area, like, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. None of it fucking inherently makes any <laughs> sense. <laughs> Again, that's what you were taught is right. And what you were taught was wrong. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Obviously there are things you should and should not do. Um, yeah. I agree. As the, as, okay. So growing up, you know, in a, in a conservative place, conservative kind of family, not wanting to be labeled a hippie. When did you, when were, when did you comfortably come out as gay? 
17. 17. Okay. So that was, so you. Oh, it was not comfortable. Uh, though. Like you did it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you did it pretty early. Like what was, what was that? What was that experience? Wow, like, I mean, as, can, as, as deep as you want yeah, to get, as deep as you're willing to get. I, I, honestly, I, I'm so sorry. I'm not really willing to get into it. Um, it was, okay. it was super yeah. traumatic. Um, very yeah. traumatic. Um, yeah, which is why I've found working with the medicines as well is actually super helpful. You know, it helps process that. Yeah. Um, so when I actually, when I first started following you, when I found you trip sitting blog, it was because I was learning <laughs> at the time. I was, and I, I guess you never stop learning, but <clears throat> I was um, working with, um, he doesn't want to be called a shaman and, you know, medicine man has a terrible connotation. So I was working with this guy. Healer, Healer. A facilitator, <laughs> because again, I don't think you, I don't think you can heal somebody else. I think you can facilitate their no. own healing, but you can't fix someone. Guide. Mm. I was working with this facilitator and where was I going with this? Oh, he was, he specializes, I feel he specializes in like generational trauma and family healing mm -hmm. and trauma healing and uh, that seems to be like his niche in, in, in the, in the medicine world. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's actually really fortuitous now that I look back at it, that I found him and that I've done some of this work with him because he, he has helped me like even in, while I was there to learn, like, you know, yeah. he's helped me resolve at least part of some of the trauma that I went through during that period um, of coming out while I was 17. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that part of helping other people inherently helps you to help yourself as well. Like once you're able to like hold space for other people and help them get through their, you know, whatever they're dealing with, again, guide them, not, not tell them, not help them, not show them where to go. It's just guiding them. But like you realize that the, like you're real, I'm, I always feel like I'm way better at giving advice to other people <laughs> than I am at giving advice to myself. Like it's so much, it's so much easier for me to do that. But then like, it takes me to actually give somebody else some advice to be like, wait, why don't I fucking do that? Wait, like, like, hold up. It's really good advice. I should do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I should, damn, that was, that was really smart. I can't believe that just came out of Super my mouth wise. right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I kind of want to take, I guess, a little bit of a, a different different direction here. So I know that you not only work with just like, I guess, mushrooms and grow them, but like you, you're interested in just like other plants in general, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I do okay. grow um, some San Pedro, uh, which is also a masculine a cactus. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I am not good at like brewing it or drying it or anything. It's just, <laughs> I, I don't think I've had enough experience or practice. And also um, I just, I'm not sure it's, it's my medicine. Um, although yeah. I absolutely love it um, when I ingest it and work with it. I just don't know if I'm the right guy to prepare it. Um, but but okay. yeah, um, other plants and things, they really do fascinate me. I think they're incredible. They're incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I do. I have this little um, Instagram. Um, what, do you, what do you even call them? Profile, which I um, I don't give a lot of attention to. I, I really need to be better with that. But I like to look at like the medicinal properties of of all sorts of plants, things that you wouldn't quite know were medicinal, or you didn't know carried some sort of property, or that they were edible, or offered some sort of mm -hmm. <clears throat> sun protection factor or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. I really do enjoy it. When did you, when did you, I guess, start getting interested in just, I guess, plants as a, as a whole? Um, probably, uh, Cam, probably about seven years ago. Um, and that actually happened, I mean, by chance, because when I started dating my now husband, um, he was already mm -hmm. in this house and, um, like I mentioned earlier, we're very fortunate to have a, a very large garden. Um, and it was his garden at the time. Uh, so yeah. I started being the gardener, really. So I started like getting involved mm -hmm. with the plants and things. And there were just some really cool plants in the garden. Um, 
And then, yep. so I started cultivating those and then like researching and like acquiring more and different varieties and things. And I think I have about 90 pot plants in the house. So it, it's okay. a lot. <laughs> I'm definitely that, that yeah. plant lady. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, the garden as well. I like, I try and keep like a really huge variety of plants and, and things. Um, not all of them are medicinal, but. I've always found that mm -hmm. they don't always have to be. I mean, you know, just looking at something beautiful can be medicinal. It's good for you. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, it, it sounds like it's almost kind of like, I mean, I, I, I don't know if this is the right word, but I mean, kind of like a meditative practice of, mm. of tending to these plants and like growing these plants and stuff like that. Like, yeah. again, something that I think meditative practice can be really anything that helps you connect with yourself and connect with nature let me just tell you as well what a what a privilege having access to to land and plants like this is because yeah you, you, i get so much joy out of um propagating these plants and like taking a year in my, my little nursery to get them going and then and then giving those mm -hmm. plants as a gift um you know whether they're medicinal or not it's just for me yeah it's the biggest thing i love it it's so cool how so like how do you how do you choose i guess which which plants you want to start growing and which ones you, you know like do, how how do you how do you, how do you do this research <laughs> so we we're going to need another hour session for that <laughs> um there's another there's another like long history for that but i don't know it, it sort of like goes we've got time <laughs> for me it's instinctive so i'll i'll walk around and i'll see oh like this plant you know, needs to be repotted or it needs to be split or it uh -huh. needs to be trimmed back or whatever the situation may be. So I will spend some time with that plant, cutting it back or um, splitting it or repotting it or whatever it is. But what happens is that I, I don't know, I just can't, I can't like trim a bush back or something and then like take those cuttings and, you know, throw them out. So if, if yeah. I do not make, little cuttings in pots or slip them or do something to get those little slips germinated um, or growing at least, I will at least chip them up and mulch them back into the garden. So I, I just mm. feel like these, you know, these gardens should also be self-sustaining. There's no reason why we should throw our lawn clippings into the dustbin. I mean, that soil has given so much of itself to produce life into that grass. And now you're cutting that grass out and you're, putting it in the trash and I'm like, why are you yeah. doing that? Put it back. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's how I do it. And then, you know, it's just whatever's going, I guess. <laughs> What's your, I like, do you have a, I guess, favorite genus or, or I don't know if that's the right word at all, but like, I guess, like, do you like working with flowers? Do you like working with like any particular type of plant that's more beautiful or anything? Or like you like, all of it so where i live is actually a surprisingly harsh environment we have a lot of wind so um okay i love aroids i grow a lot of them indoors that most of my um plants in the house are aroids um what is an aroid yeah like a philodendron or a monstera yeah okay, and okay there's yep. lots of different um species of those so um i grow a lot of those uh, in the house and then out, outdoors, I try as best I can, although I, I, actually I don't try at all. I, I, I do plant a lot of indigenous <laughs> plants only because I know that they will survive the harsh climate. But um, yeah. I'm still like so tempted by like tropicals and like um, exotic plants that I do plant a lot of them too. Um, flowers can really cool, just don't work for me. So <laughs> I like flowers if I buy them and put them in the house. But I have yeah. been trying to be better with that only because one of my husband's insane projects is that um, he has four beehives on in the garden. So we also keep bees. Four beehives. Yeah, we also okay. keep bees. So um, we have these four <laughs> beehives. So I do try and plant a lot of like flowering basil and geraniums and things that will at least give them some sort of flower. Um, yeah. yeah. For do you guys... Do you guys get honey for yeah, the bees? Yeah, we do. Uh, last year, uh, I think we got 92 kgs out of our four hives. 92 kilograms yeah. of honey? Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> it's a lot. What the yeah. fuck? 
What do you do with all that? Do you, is, are those are just gifts that you're able to give yeah, to people? Do you sell them at a farmer's no, market? No, like it's a, it's a novelty. So we we don't actually eat much of it. I think if we eat one jar a year, it's a lot. So we we give it away like to our friends and family, and then. Um, you know, when you get like work colleagues that ask and you don't like them, then yeah, we, we sell it to them. <laughs> um, but generally we, we like. give it away. Um, it's also, it's just such a nice, it's such a nice gift to give someone like a jar of honey that you oh, have absolutely. farmed and, you know, you've looked after those bees and made sure that they're okay. Um, oh yeah. Then like, I feel we like do a lot of other industrious stuff with it. Sorry to interrupt you, but we like make some candles and stuff out of the wax and yeah, yeah, we enjoy it. That's, that's, that's awesome. I, so like I, I've always, I, I grew up pretty scared of bees. Um, and I, I, I don't, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself scared of bees anymore. Cause like, I know, I know they're not going to hurt me. Like I know Yours if I don't, if I don't fuck with them, you. they're not going to fuck like with me. Ours are the African killer bees. They will hurt you. Oh, what the <laughs> yeah, fuck? They will, they will destroy you. <laughs> Those, okay. So, so do you, like, how do you, how do you handle these bees? Like, do you guys have like, like big ass suits yeah. that you guys got to, got to wear? And yeah, we have will suits they just like, the will they just sting you out of nowhere? Yeah, well, um, so we, if we're going to work in the hive, then we smoke them so that they go down into like the brood chamber and then we can take off the supers. Um, so we okay. do that, but then you also have to wear like the full gear with like leather or rubber gloves because they will attack you even when we do it at night, but they will still attack. If you get too close to the hive or if you upset them, but they don't like the smell of earth. So if you're digging around in the soil, they'll attack you. If your perfume is too strong, they will attack you. If you are using like a, petrol powered lawnmower too close to they will attack you <laughs> so it sounds like they'll just attack they you they love it it sounds like they just really like attacking <laughs> yeah. do they do they also when they sting do they die they do. or do they not die when they no, okay no, they got do. it so they just don't give a no, shit no, no they really don't <laughs> shame um <laughs> so one well two of our five dogs are pomeranians and um the one mm -hmm. you, uh, you know them like a lot of hair so the yep, one small yeah, the one got too close to the hive one day and came like running back into the house and he was just humming and um shame we had to pick out these bees out of his hair he just oh. got too close and <laughs> yeah that set them shame and they attacked, they attacked him, him yeah. which is which which is which is what, they, what do. they do <laughs> do you i i mean have you guys how did how did you learn how to keep bees like that's that's not something that I've ever even so, come close to. Yeah. So my, my husband, like I told you, is like super into fleeting hobbies, although he does tend the bees. He, he really does keep them well. Um, mm -hmm. But his uncle, when, when he was a kid on the farm, had bees. So he yeah. learned from his uncle. And then, of course, you just grab a book or, you know, read a how-to on, on Google or find a video on YouTube and you're sorted. It's really not that difficult. Do you have any any stories of when you guys like have have like really fucked up? <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> a friend of ours also keeps bees, and um, one day he, he, but I think he's got like twelve. On, he's got a very large stand, and I think he's got like twelve. And um, one day, I don't know what he was doing; he was completely fucking around. But he put one super from one hive onto another hive, I believe. And you should never do that because they can smell; it's not there their home yeah and they went absolutely ballistic and um attacked like everything that was moving and then they, they uh -oh. attacked his dad who was like in his early 90s and this poor guy had to like run Ooh. and jump in the pool and then <laughs> like splash like this to like get the bees away and eventually yeah. he could get out the pool and then um he had to go lie down i think he had well over 100 stings all over his body and then Oh they... my God. Yeah. I, I, I'd be okay. Like, I mean, I was scared of bees after just getting stung, like maybe 10 yeah, times as a kid. He, I'd be fucking terrified. could have died. So it was, it, what was funny was that, um, uh, my, my husband's friend sent his son to go check on grandpa and, um, mm -hmm. he went in and he was just like listening and saying, like, yeah, yeah, he's breathing. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> as, as long as he's still yeah, breathing. Grandpa was breathing. <laughs> um for sure dude well that's uh that's do, i mean are there any like i don't know any 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 other hobbies that you like are are 
thinking about like looking forward to like any anything else in your life that you're i guess actively trying to like work towards or change at the moment whether it's from your microdosing practice you're trying to trip sit more have you actually done any i guess trip sitting facilitating yourself now because i know you were originally learning to do that when i disappointed you with my blog oh, but, no. Um... <laughs> no you didn't disappoint me um so i haven't i haven't facilitated anyone i think i'm at a point where i'm ready now however you know with mm -hmm. these things i think that unless you're doing it through like johns hopkins university in which case they want you to be like a nurse or some sort of medical Certified. professional, you you can't really yeah. do this thing and come away with a certificate. Hey, congratulations! You can trips it now. So, um, yeah. I haven't done any, but I'm definitely yeah. looking forward to it. And I've like put it out there. Um, I've told a couple of friends, but I'm not going to go looking for it. I feel like I'll wait for it to come to yeah. me. Um, but that's definitely that's that's how the universe works. Absolutely. It's things. Yeah. Things will come to you when you're ready for them to come yeah. to you. And like searching for answers, rarely will you find the right answer. Yeah, very rarely. So that, I mean, that is where <laughs> I'm going, Cam. I mean, I'd love to do this full time, um, you know, just like yeah. help pe people heal themselves and just give them that sort of opportunity and facilitate them and help them as best I could and advise them from my perspective. I think something that, you can only do is advise from your own experience. So as much experience yeah. as you have, you may be better able to equip, better equipped and um, able to help someone. Yeah. Like what we were talking about earlier, like it's, it's not about giving people the answers. It's much more about teaching people how to ask the right questions. Absolutely. That's so well put. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the job of, I mean, any sort of guide facilitator, mm -hmm. somebody who's holding space, it's like just helping people. Like I, I wholeheartedly believe inherently we have every single answer to anything that we want already inside of us. I like, I so, so believe that already. It's just like, we have all these blockers that we've put up at some point in our lives that make it hard for us to see those answers and basically like know which questions to ask because we've done these things to protect ourselves because oh. we needed to do that in the past. And so once you can shed a lot of that and like, it's just, it's really like truly learning how to trust your intuition. And that's hard. That's really hard to do. Like that was, I, I, I just took after I became unemployed recently, um, I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? So I took, I took LSD on Thursday um, so it was a beautiful day outside. <laughs> That's one does. Casual fair, Thursday, fair. LSD. <laughs> yep. yep, yep, exactly. So I did that. And, and something that, like, one of the themes that came up was, like, how I've, I've you know, made me realize, like, I've, I've blocked myself from really, from, like, trusting myself. Like, I, I almost, it's, like, un, it's relearning how to actually trust my intuition and how to learn my gut mm. for who I am now after I've, dealt with a lot of these, you know, traumas that have come up in my life and, and understood why I think the way that I think and like, you know, asking the questions, okay, is this, is this me thinking this or is this like the past version of me that's wanting me to do this anyway? And just, and, and understanding how to trust myself again. I like that a lot because I think the past version of you may not even be the past version of you. It could be generational yep. thinking and that is what for instance your dad would have done in that situation and so you picked that up as a learned behavior and really that's not being true and that's not really how you would have dealt with it at all so yep. to be conscious of that i mean is amazing cam you say some amazing stuff you should write it down in a blog <laughs> <laughs> you know what i might i might just do that Definitely. i do want to I do want to write more now that I have just ample free time. <laughs> um, I think that would be a good, a good way for me to get all of my thoughts down to do something. I, I do. I, I also, I know at some point in my life, I want to write a book and you mentioned too, that you want to put the things that you're doing with plants into a book as well. Right. I, I have started. I mean, it's okay. Sure. I mean, you say a book it's at the moment, it's between like three or four different apps because I have a spreadsheet yep of like all of the different <laughs> like strains of psilocybe cubensis and like their properties and their chemical structures and th their visual effects and their um, the way that they make you feel. 
I don't know. And then I've also like started sketching some of them and then I've started writing about some of them. So it's actually a mess, but <laughs> I don't know where it's going do you, right now. Do you have a favorite um, strain, I guess, that you personally like taking or like, have you done enough research and like experimentation that like, you know, if you want to sort of feel a certain way, you can do this one. And if you want to get people more introspective, you can do another one. Yeah. So <clears throat> there are certain strains. And again, I think that they affect everybody differently. So, I mean, again, I can only offer what I've experienced, but there are certain... Based on your personal yeah, experience. There are, certain, there are certain strains that have more of like a rush feeling and very little like mm -hmm. um, hallucinogenic properties, like very little visuals. Um, and then there yeah. are some that have like a great mix of both. And then there are some that are like extremely visually um, hallucinogenic. So yeah. um, that is what I'm trying to capture. And in terms of a favorite, um, yes and no. So I don't really have favorites. You you can't with with children. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> the, I, find, I find the general the generally the best um, reviews that I get from people who I, I give these medicines to, I'm getting the best reviews from a strain called golden teacher. I'm sure you know it. It's um, yep. a really common one. Now, unfortunately for whatever reason, uh, the recording software that I'm using decided to just cut out right about at this moment. Uh, so we didn't end up recording. It was, it was only about four more minutes that we ended up talking. Um, but once again, I really wanted to thank Jack for coming on the podcast. I really had a lot of fun recording that. And to anybody who's listening, really appreciate it as well. Uh, please follow on whatever podcast platform or whatever that you're using to uh, to listen to this and share it with a friend if you think that they might find it interesting. Really appreciate you all and looking forward to next week.